Your yeah. tenants aren't paying rent. That's somebody's got to pay that. Somebody got to pay the mortgage. Somebody's got to pay the utilities. You know, and and yeah. uh, that's going to be you, right? If you're yeah. not uh, careful. So um, definitely doing great due diligence before you get into contract. Before you're kind of pursuing anything is just you know knowing that area. Uh, and some areas more than others. I would say Florida is is one of those very pocketed. And so you got to be really uh, hone in on not just look at your market data, but actually drive the area and, and know kind of what you're getting into. Absolutely. I've seen on your profile that you have um, uh, negotiating experience and skill sets. What are some skills? How, how do you how do you work on negotiating skills? What are some techniques that you've used? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Uh... <laughs> All right, welcome to Real Estate Hustlers Podcast. I am your host, Josh Appleman, founder and CEO of Appleman Properties. Today, we are joined with Brent Ritchie. Brent is the founder and president of Enrich Investment Group Incorporated. Brent has over 18 years of experience in engineering, construction, and project management. His latest projects involve the ownership, management, and operations, and development of an apartment building worth over $350 million. Brent, we're excited to have you on today. If you could, let the listeners know a little more about yourself. Awesome. Yeah, Josh, thanks so much for having me and uh, um, excited to be part of this uh, this show. So uh, Brent Ritchie, originally from a little small town in Canada, a uh, little small farming town and uh, kind of grew up, you know, had uh, always entrepreneurial minded and, and focused and really saw, um, you know, kind of continuing on that quest and on that that journey. Um, I did end up going through, uh, took engineering I uh, started working on some uh, bridge projects and always had a couple of side hustles on 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 the uh, on the side. Um, and so, yeah, working on some bridge projects kind of globally and, and uh, internationally um, and had a lot of a lot of fun with that. But uh, learned that working behind a cubicle crunching numbers uh, wasn't uh, wasn't for me. So kind of from there, branched off into industrial engineering sales, um, did that for a few years and then really saw. Kind of okay. How do I get out of this rat race? How do I, you know, replace the the nine to five? How do I uh, kind of make a future for for myself? Right. A lot of people maybe listening here now just don't have, um, you know, you're thinking of the future and you're thinking of okay, how do I save up for the future and what what does my plan look like when I'm 60, 70, 80 years old? I never like the uh, the mentality or the plan of hey, I want to make less then than I do now. And so I was kind of looking at you know, some different options and paradigms and, and kind of shifting that that mentality and, and kind of the search and the quest for for something different. So long story short, you know, kind of said, OK, here's you know, I want something where I can do from anywhere, um, which my life, my my wife later on says, I didn't realize now you can actually work from anywhere. Um, it has a double, double, uh, double narrative there. Uh, but want to be able to work from anywhere with an internet connection. I don't want to be involved in the day-to-day -day of the business. I want to be able to kind of oversee it, set up the system, set up the processes and, and scale. And so that that was really the criteria. And that's, you know, kind of what eventually directed me looking at a couple of different franchises. And then uh, back 2000, end of 2016, 2017, really looking and focusing on the, the multifamily sector. Um, before that, had a little bit of experience working for, a couple uh, landlords with some student housing and doing what we call turns, right? You're somebody moves out, you're getting it ready for the next tenant, maybe doing some renovations, uh, contract services and landscaping and and um, and snow plowing in the winter time, you know, getting properties leased up and everything. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what really ultimately took me from the um, yeah, just that 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 whole journey, that whole process, really from that nine to five grind to uh to uh kind of full time um on my own uh own company own business here awesome yeah it's a uh, sounds like you were in search of something and you, you took different avenues to find out if you're the right fit like going through franchises owning different businesses and then ultimately led you to uh to real estate is that correct that's right that's right and, and you already had experience working for another landlord so that that certainly helps um how long did you did you work for the landlord uh, you know, it's kind of end of high school, early university. So did that for for a few years uh, in that process. Um, so kind of saw everything, everything minus, you know, owning the actual physical assets themselves. But um, yeah, just kind of wherever, wherever I could be of help and service. And, and uh, but yeah, really almost 
from that that window yeah it was looking at multiple different franchises and businesses you know having some different different companies on the side as well but really seeing something that's a little bit more uh tried true proven scalable you know have systems and processes uh for that and so that's um yeah yeah it was a it was a good journey to to get to this this point but um very much you know kind of 2017 uh launch full multifamily and um you know have have subsequently you know kind of scaled up um since then absolutely and that's one of the best ways I, in my opinion to get into real estate is um it's kind of pick if you pick your path but then working with with a uh, an existing company whether it's a um, capital investment company or an operator like a property management company um, or both someone a company that's vertically integrated they buy sell and uh, manage their own properties and getting uh, first uh, first position experience on um, on the entire operation um, that's great for sure for sure and and you're doing development now too is that correct yeah so a, a lot of the kind of so I did the civil structural um so a lot of that was you know and and I actually worked for a general contractor kind of during that time kind of university time uh so work for a general contractor doing a bunch of uh you know so the site supervisor and then uh, project manager um so it was started as labor you know mixing concrete and picking up garbage and and uh you know cleaning cleaning properties getting them ready and you know just wherever you can get involved and then kind of moved up and and started running some own own projects so yeah I got involved in the the construction side early on uh and then really in the engineering space you know we did some uh larger larger scale projects um massive infrastructure tunnel projects and and bridges kind of all over the world um so that's that was uh that was an interesting journey but uh, yeah projects small projects were typically 100 million dollars and then um infrastructure and bridges you know go up go up dramatically so um i got the opportunity to work on some uh really fascinating ones but that was heavy entrenched into uh into the development more infrastructure development uh and then you know kind of what we saw is you know if you can do those projects those are are very complicated you know a lot of building projects are a lot simpler um so it's you know typical slab on grade and you're you're building you know yeah just your infrastructure projects are are a little bit more involved so um got involved into the the building sector space and and so we have a project right now central florida uh where we're um, looking to go vertical so kind of finished all our horizontal site works and and uh, see see a lot of opportunities obviously some challenges with the current market uh with uh with debt um but you know huge 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 growth opportunities we see and that's um in development the amount of time that it takes for uh, the entitlements and everything to go through to to where you actually have cranes on site is uh, I mean there's cases where it could take upwards of 10 years by the time that that project is broken broken ground it, it's just incredible the amount of resources and um, and teamwork that that is involved to get these projects through to approval and then construction to begin. And uh, yeah, and, and I mean, with that, I think you want to de-risk yourself and de-risk, you know, your your opportunities that you're looking at. Um, ideally, you already have a clear path to that entitlement. You know, everything's already zoned and ready to go for that. Um, you know, there is an opportunity going from raw land to to zone and title. Yeah. Uh, but then, if you're looking at a project and you're trying to shorten that time frame. Especially if you're working with a city or a jurisdiction that's a lot more um, builder friendly, then then you kind of collapse those timeframes, right? And if you can get something uh, zoned and entitled, ready to go, you know, then then you're even for shorter time frame. Yeah, for sure, because the debt markets can actually change during the the planning of the project. It's uh, from year over year over year. <laughs> yes, uh, it's wild. Yes, that's yes. If if uh, yeah, uh, definitely risk profile with development is is quite a bit higher. And so, you know, you, you, <laughs> you, you definitely go through a lot more challenges, I would say. But the opportunities are so much greater. I mean, you're, you're ending up with a brand new product. Everything's brand new. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. 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 You're, uh, and you're creating, you're creating opportunity. You're creating value, right? You're started with a plot of land, you know, or yeah. you started with something that you're going to completely change the fit form function of. And then you're ending with something that's, you know, kind of highest, best use for that area or just, a super important for the people that are going to uh, reside there, whether it's triple net leases, corporate tenants, um, or, you know, individuals. So, yeah, absolutely. 
I seen on your profile that you have um, uh, negotiating experience and skill sets. What are some skills? How, how do you how do you work on negotiating skills? What are some techniques that you've used? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, the the art of the deal. I would highly recommend that one. That was a really good good one. Um, this is before anything became all political about it. Um, and then <laughs> um, his his uh, his lawyer actually wrote a really good book that I'm blanking on the name right now. Um, but he wrote a really good book about Trump style negotiation. That's the name of the title. Uh, so those are those are great titles and great ones to kind of get into um, with negotiation. So uh, a lot of money to be, you know, kind of saved or made in that process. And so, uh, you know, and, and some of it's just as you're going through the journey, as you're going through and you're, you're, you know, one step at a time, right, from where you are right now. And if it's something you want to get better at, you know, why don't you go practice, go to a local flea market or go to a local, um, you know, Hispanic grocery store or something, right, where, where maybe that that is a bit more customary. Um, and then you'll be able to like barter or have have prices and have conversations and negotiate back and forth, right. And so um, it's, it's definitely a process, um, still still working, still learning on it as well. Uh, but it's all, you know, I think there's a lot of psychology behind it of understanding what, uh, you know, what your goals are and then what the seller's goals are as well, right? And how you can kind of help them achieve what they want and, and in effect, you know, get what you want. Yeah, I, I can't agree with you more. There, there's always goals to be met and there's a balance point. So if, as long as things are balanced during negotiations through to the closing table, I feel like everyone walks away with a win and, and bottles can be popped. And that's where finding the balance, finding the even a pain point, and then um, a tactic is capitalizing on the pain point and not necessarily exposing it, but it, but I mean just making the balance, making everyone feel like they're they're winning through the through the the course of the the closing the transaction. It's um just it's a part of it. I mean, there's um there's so many, and I ask because there there's you can get hosed during the process of of contract as well if you're not um very good at negotiation you're um you could just get trampled on and uh, i think it's a skill set that is ever evolving but you can definitely learn some tactics that um, make the seller or the buyer feel like they're they're winning uh, yeah at the same time you meet your goals too yeah i was trying to find the other one never split the difference is another one by chris boss yeah it's a great book too fantastic and there's one more that i'm trying to remember it's an older one um if if i come across it i will um share it but yeah those those are definitely great starting points on on kind of upping your negotiation game awesome what are some uh what are some personal goals for your real estate uh, journey moving forward yeah no great question you know where our focus is multifamily you know that's really uh the bread the butter the, the everything that we do right now um, some of that is going to look at the development sector, development space, and kind of how do we provide some, um, see some more opportunity maybe in there that's uh, some gaps that are missing in specific communities and pockets. Um, and, you know, yeah, on the on the kind of acquisition side, we're constantly looking and, and uh, you know, our focus is more kind of in Sun Belts, um, specifically kind of Texas and Florida. Um, and looking for really where we see those great value add opportunities, where we're still conservative in our approach, conservative in our underwriting and our pro forma, um, and, but also um, able to kind of capitalize where we see see some great opportunities. So, you know, I think we're seeing a massive reset, a massive shift right now um, in this space. And, um, you know, the challenge also creates opportunities. And so, you know, we're, we're both... Um, yeah, looking forward to to uh, kind of helping people through this and and uh, you know seeing some massive wins on the other side. So, Brent, what the, when when you're looking for multifamily, are you coming in as a capital partner, as a as a sponsor? What what, what part of the uh, general partnership or even the deal are you all looking to be a part of? Yeah, great question. Uh, so, typically, we're we're buying and running and operating our own deals. Um, okay. And, uh, but, you know, in uncertain cases where we see just, hey, this is fantastic opportunity, something we'd like to expose our, our investors to, you know, then that's where we can kind of, you know, get involved with other aspects of the, the property, but, you know, provide those, those opportunities for our investors. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I think there's, there's a lot of 
a lot of things you learn <laughs> through yeah. through the process and you know that's huge value that you can bring to to teams as well so um obviously you know we we definitely live and die by the mantra you do business with people you know like and trust you know and so um as you're kind of building relationships you know constantly we get people bringing us opportunities um or vice versa right we're seeing kind of opportunities where we're like hey this person would be the right fit connection to bring in what areas are you all looking to invest in right now as far as um throughout the united states yeah so um in Texas specifically, we really like the the Houston, the DFWs, the Dallas Fort Worth area, um, Austin, San Antonio, uh, Houston specifically more kind of like the north half, a little bit further away from the coast, um, and probably more Class A in that market. Uh, Dallas Fort Worth, we're kind of in that 1980s and newer, um, and then you know kind of Austin, San Antonio would probably fall in that same space, kind of the A B size, um, and. Uh, and in Florida, um, we're avoiding South Florida, but the rest of it is is pretty much fair game, probably for insurance. I'm loving Central Florida a little bit more than the coast. The coasts are are getting hammered right now, um, and so you know we're really, really, um, yeah, kind of that A B space. Um, C, some C. You know, we we um, did really well and and made our investors a ton of money on one of our C assets. So I'm I'm not completely ignoring it but if it's got you know chiller boiler galvanized steel piping then it's something that we're we're either going to heavily capitalize and prepare for in advance or just avoid altogether um yeah for yeah. stories about the chiller systems it's uh um, <laughs> and, and oh, with, yeah. the, with apartments anything can go wrong it's just like you'd said just prepare for it and um you know ex just expect things and you're underwriting to to maybe go south and then you're you're prepared but uh yeah avoid yeah. it you know just in, insurance risk is is pretty high too so you know as as insurance prices has gone have gone up i guess the time of this recording of the show this will be more time sensitive um you know hurricane ian was about a year ago uh not quite a year ago and so that caused a lot of damage a lot of insurance carriers to pull out and so you know kind of your price is going through the roof you know same with texas you had freeze and you had some other other events going on and so you had insurance going through the roof and it's um, created some pain, some temporary pain. Um, but um, you know, uh, we don't we don't see that to, to last forever. Nobody knows the future, but um, yeah, we'll see see how that goes. So yeah, th those would be the markets, and then really avoiding some of those kind of more storm um, ridden areas. It, it would be impossible to underwrite insurance costs going from say three hundred a unit to eighteen hundred a unit over the course of a year. I mean, that's, there, there's, that has definitely been a, a very big pain point for a lot of operators on just the insurance costs. Yes. Uh, yes. That, and then uh, their bridge debt um, going from interest only to amortizing and then the uh, no rate cap. I mean, there's, there's definitely been some, some mega shifts in the markets um, just over the past year and a half. Um, what are some fastest, things? But isn't it the fastest increase read in fastest interest increase uh that has they've ever had you know and so um you know i think you got to go back to 80s and 90s or 70s and 80s you know where we saw these these rates kind of high as they are now right so as of the time of the recording your treasuries are what is us 10 year treasuries floating around 4.1 4.2 uh and then you know bridge debt really is sizing probably eight to nine percent you know maybe over nine percent so it's uh it's 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 uh you're, you're right uh insurance taxes and uh and debt have have you know definitely created some some challenges yeah even like you just said uh even the uh, the taxes being reassessed to the uh the new market value based on the purchase price if they didn't purchase the llc at closing uh there's there's different things out there to where operators can certainly get in trouble and then there's opportunities that are born essentially overnight uh, what yeah. are the, some of the ways that you all are hedging against the uh, the changing markets? Yeah, so any any new deals that we're looking on, I mean, we're definitely looking to ride through, you know, the the current headwinds. Um, and so, you know, looking at some fixed debt with some variable exit strategies. You know, anybody of us, you know, any of us that bought, you know, 18, 2018, 19, you know, treasuries were in four or five percent and then, you know, dropped, dropped off pretty steeply. And so um, if you didn't size those deals properly, 
uh, your prepayment penalties on your loans grew dramatically. You know, we had some of our our prepayment penalties grow over a third of the loan, third of the price of the loan. Um, and so those created some hurdles and some challenges. Uh, the market was booming, and so it, it kind of forgave a lot of those sins. Um, but what we're looking at doing is kind of, yeah, looking at, hey, fixing, fixing, taking that risk off the table for the next couple of years. So via fixed rate debt, um, or, you know, you just buy an ex more expensive interest rate cap during, but a longer horizon um, to kind of weather through this. So instead of a three to five year exit, you'd say maybe a seven to 10? Yeah, I would say it really depends on the time. Um, yeah, so, but for debt, you know, five, seven, 10 years, depending on the assets themselves. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that either. I mean, as long as you're cash flowing all the way through the um, the, the cycle and, um, and then you have an exit or a couple of refi events, if the markets um, let that happen, then it works. Yeah. I mean, yeah. ultimately, when you sell an asset, then you create a whole another problem of buying another, another asset to invest in. So it's an ever-evolving circle of, uh, of just placing capital. So it's, yes, um, good good problems to have. <laughs> uh, right, exactly. So it's, uh, yeah. as long as you've done the, executed on the business plan and everyone wins, it's, uh, it, it's a win-win. Um, yeah. So are you all relying on third-party property management on your properties? Yeah, so typically we've done that, uh, stayed leaner uh, within the team our, ourselves. And then, um, yeah, we were just third-party property management company, depending on the market and the specialization of that property management company there. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm enjoying, enjoying that aspect. So instead of managing, you know, two to 300 people and losing even more hair, right? Yeah. I got to, uh, <laughs> I got to. Yeah, we're we're you know kind of a smaller, leaner team, um, and then kind of third party out our our management. Right, and uh, the third party, I, I think it depends on the size of the properties too. Because we've got a we've got quite a few scatter size, smaller like sub sub fifty units, and it's um it's tougher to make sense of property management at that size, third party. But when you're a hundred units plus, and the property can afford professional property management, um, that essentially place the right people in, then it, it definitely it chalks out and. It, it makes sense and it's a win. Um, and then yeah. you're just pushing the asset management, making sure the property is is uh, performing. Um, yeah. Sure they're, they're taking off all the metrics you want to see. Yeah, exactly. And now you're kind of monitoring your business plan and then making sure that you're on track. And if you're not, right, making any adjustments and, and uh, you know, your people, your price, your your product and and making sure, you know, kind of that you're, you're uh, you know, providing a great, great place for residents and, and you know, for your investors to, to uh, make some good return. Yeah. What What is one of the biggest challenges that you've that you've faced on on a property that you've had? Oh my gosh, <laughs> the biggest challenge. Um, that that is a great question. Um, definitely, this has been probably more challenging times. Um, we have defined criteria and new criteria based on operations of some some prior prior assets. And so, um, you know, you get something with a lift station, those are very problematic. I think in the multifamily space, they're in the top 10, you know, most problematic things that you can have on a property. Um, lots of things get flushed on those toilets and they get lodged in the pumps. And when that happens, your pumps stop working and now you get, you know, back up and that goes back into units and, you know, there's environmental uh, mitigation or, or potential damage too, right? That you got to be very careful on. So um, that definitely causes some issues. Um, we are not, uh, I'm not, not managing in the hood and, uh, and very careful to make sure we don't buy there. Uh, that just has a lot of, a lot of issues, you know, when you get walk-up windows for drug dealers and, um, you know, lots of other, other terrible things happening at properties, uh, that's just for a certain, certain type of owner that wants to kind of tackle those problems. And I'm glad, glad for them. Um, that is just not something that I want to spend my life energy on. Um, I mean, storms, like, let's, uh, you know, if you're deductible three, four, five, you know, sometimes even like 10%, you know, you're seeing some of these deductibles on, on properties. If, if a property gets hit by a storm and you have a massive deductible, that's going to create some issues, right? You're not going to see the impact of that until everything's finally settled. And that might take 12 plus months, but you know, if your deductibles, you know, 700, 800, a million, 1.5, 2, 3, 4, 5, 
you know, whatever that number is, that's something that you got to really have in your risk profile, right? And you don't really pay attention to those details until you're going through through an event, right? So if you're yeah. you're looking at something and you're like, oh, I just want the cheapest insurance possible, but you just you know put your deductible at five percent of your total project, that's a that can be a significant you know amount of money, and and is that something you can take on as a as a risk, you know, if something happened? And so, um, yeah, <laughs> between not buying in the hood anymore and um and making sure kind of in any storm um or properties that would be have some more storm exposure right that you're just mitigating that risk accordingly or just avoiding avoiding those areas yeah i think for i think you hit it on the head for the uh for the listeners beginner if it's easy to get into it's going to be hard to get out of and if you're buying in the hood it's going to be one of those properties where you, you can change the property, but you cannot change the area. Mm -hmm. And no matter what you do, it's, it's just going to be uh, a constant headache and a pain point. And um, and there's cases where tenants can essentially take over the property and, um, and you're up a creek. Uh, so yeah. And if your tenants aren't paying rent, that's somebody's got to pay that. Somebody got to pay the mortgage. Somebody's got to pay the utilities, you know, and, and yeah. uh, that's going to be you, right? If you're yeah. not uh, careful. So um, definitely doing great due diligence before you get into contract, before you're kind of pursuing anything is just, you know, knowing that area, uh, in some areas more than others, I would say Florida is, is one of those very pocketed. And so you got to be really, uh, hone in on not just look at your market data, but actually drive the area and, and know kind of what you're getting into. Yeah. Now, now on the other point, if you can find a D property or a low C property in a B class area, that's, that's a recipe for a major opportunity. Um, huge. It's going to be a, a heavy lift. It's going to be very, very tough for the first twelve months. But after you get that that thing repositioned, uh, you're 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 going to be good. You're going to be very good. And we have we had an uh, opportunity to do do a project just like that. And it's um, it's phenomenal. Um, those are good points. So don't buying in the right the right area. Uh, insurance. I, I totally totally agree with you. They only must make it to a point where you don't even want you can't even make an insurance claim. So like you have to go take out another loan to get the damage done, anyways. Or to get the damage fixed instead of making a making a claim, um, and, and then preparing for the unknown, the storms and things that can, can come through. I mean, it's it's um, just underwriting the uh, the contingency factors in there. Is that about right? Yes. Yeah. For sure. Um, how would you recommend that a, um, a a beginning real estate investor? How would you recommend that they um, they, they start their path down real estate? Yeah, you know, I think it, just being in an ecosystem is is key, right? You don't want to be in your own silo and you just don't know what you don't know. You know, you might be a specialist or maybe you're just even new and, and you don't even, you know, know, know a whole lot and you haven't been down that, right? We all started somewhere and so we all started new. Um, but really, you know, being in a, uh, I think, an ecosystem in a group that um, you can learn from, right? And that you can understand kind of many different aspects to the business, right? Once you're a business owner, you know, if you have a job, you are responsible for that job, but you're the owner, you're responsible for all 360, right? You're responsible for it all. And so just being, um, I would say, in an ecosystem where people are buying, owning, operating, you know, and kind of the the asset that you're looking in and the, and the type of product that you're looking at um, is, is paramount, right? So you got sounding boards, you got somebody, anybody you can call, hey, you know, what about this? Or I'm having this challenge, you know, and how do I tackle it because if if I got to walk through a minefield I don't want to be the first to walk through right I want to I want to go on the shoulders or walk behind somebody that's already walked through it before and so I think that's that's really um important I would say now more than ever uh just to make sure hey you know how am I looking at this how am I underwriting this how am I uh viewing this opportunity yeah, that's that's incredible advice because essentially you're if you've got a helping hand, you've got guidance, your 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 confidence is level just is is boosted because you know that no matter what happens, you're you're getting professional advice and guidance that's already been there and done it. Um I, I even to say somebody who's actively doing it gets get some help or just be in the room of people that are that are doing deals. Um learn language and get in front of them. Um, what other uh, what books help you get to where where you're currently at? 
Oh man, I I am uh, I never used to really be a reader. Full transparency, um, I did it, you know, because I knew I should, but it would take me forever to get through a book. Um, so I started with a speed reading book. You know, it's a good good first start because then you can you know kind of go through content a lot faster. Uh, and then you know the Audible, of course, th those are fantastic as well. You know, especially you can put them in your ears and then two x speed. Um, so so those those have been really good and and it's been such a journey kind of along the way um love love uh dan sullivan's books um and benjamin hardy uh the who not how the gap in the yeah. game you know those have been fantastic books um i definitely um it's leadership not by the book um david green was a fantastic yeah. book as well. So, you know, really there's so much gems and so much uh, wisdom we can learn from people um, just through through the content that they create. And so, um, yeah, that that has been uh, very, very important in this, this path. And I just got recommended Hunter Thompson's Capital Raising book recently. Um, so I got to get on that one. And then Joe Fearless, um, his- yeah, Harvard's Education. Yes, yeah. Essentially yeah. a blueprint. That's a, yes. all great books. So, I, so I, I just last night was recommended those two books. So those are on my list and going to check them out. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and that's just like audible. And uh, I do 1.25. I try I try a 1.5, but it's just, <laughs> I'd love to do the 2X. It's just, just tough to, uh, to, to hit all the nuggets in 2X. But man, if you can get, if you get surface knowledge and then go mile deep, that's, um, that's huge. It can. Uh, oh, big time, big time. You know, and I found that with AirPods in, I can do two X or, or, or faster, depending on Dan speaks yeah. a little slower. And so I can do three for him. Um, yeah. but, uh, but if I'm just listening to a speaker in my car, then yeah, that's, that's, I find it much harder and it drives my wife nuts. Uh, oh, so that, um, yeah, those, those are, those have been very important in, in learning and growing. What about a mastermind group? Are you involved with any or have you have you been to any events? Yes. Yeah. So we were in a mastermind the last two years um, and then subsequently kind of um, starting starting one of our own as well. Um, so we're doing one of those that we're just launching. Actually, we had our first kickoff last night um, and nice. yeah, more more of a I got it's I would say more of a co-op think tank style. Um, so, and, yeah, no, those are. Those are great, you know, and your group will evolve. It'll keep on growing as the the personality in the group evolves, and it's just essentially putting the energy in the room and people that are interested in the in the same topics. That's um that's perfect. Awesome, uh, Brent. If somebody wants to get a hold of you to learn more about yourself, your company, possibly invest with you, how can they get a hold of you? Yeah, best way uh, if you go right to our website, enrichinvestments.com. E N R I T C H investments.com. Uh, our contact information is there. You can see a little bit more about us and what we do and what we've been involved in. Um, and that would be, that would be a great, great place. Awesome. Very cool. Great. I look forward to following you and your journey in multifamily and real estate investments. Um, you're definitely a real estate hustler. Appreciate you having coming on the show today and uh, we'll talk soon. Awesome. Thank you, Josh. Right. Thank you. Bye.